uh, welcome to a special show tonight. And, um, well, it's a replay, uh, but there's fresh content. Uh, we are live. Uh, when we first broadcast this, uh, this show in uh, 2019, almost a little more than three years ago, we didn't, ha- we didn't stream it live. And we thought, uh, of all the shows we've ever done, this one would be fun in the live chat. So for you live viewers, I think this is going to be a treat. Um, I'm here in the uh, studio with uh, Amish Ambush, who's on this show. And uh, he's our show ombudsman and uh, consultant. Um, but um, no one could kick this show off except uh, the heart and soul of Presby cast, Resby. Hit it, Resby. As the first and oldest Presbyterian podcast, we at PresbyCast often get asked what some of our favorite episodes are. The first one that kind of comes to mind is Tiny Church Nation, which is where uh, the world was first introduced to America's OPC sweetheart, Chris Drew. We always enjoy having Dan Borbin on when he comes on to talk about Festivus and air his grievances and demonstrate his feats of strength. Who could forget the incredible fried chicken episode where, in stunning, brave, high definition radio, myself, Chortles Weekly, and Bendel Wary decided that we would eat fried chicken sandwiches and talk about them on air? All of this stays within the purview, and the rules of PresbyCast, which are, as everyone knows, no beer reviews. But there is one that stands head and shoulders above the rest, and I worry that too many people haven't listened to it. The episode you are going to hear is that episode. It is the musical review episode, where myself, Presbyterian, Chortles Weekly, Amish Ambush, and the stunning, controversial, exhilarating, good-looking, D-bag worship guy listen to a Baptist musical and review um, with clarity, fortitude, and courage every single song that appears in the musical. What you will hear is raw emotion, completely devoid of any filter. We are being vulnerable. We are being authentic. And most of all, we are collecting our brains as they spill out of our nose as we laugh so hard that tears pour from our eyes freely. As I said, this is a raw emotional episode If you have children, you should bring them closer to the speaker so that they can hear how much fun we had watching this show. This is truly the greatest episode of any podcast ever recorded. You are fortunate to be alive at a time when you can hear it, and if you were there on the day it released, we hope that you avoided any major traffic collision if you were listening to it into your car because it's very unlikely you were able to drive straight or keep control of your automobile while laughing so hard. I really can't understate this enough. There is no episode of any podcast that will ever surpass the incredible achievement we awarded ourselves here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Resby, and uh, you certainly are the master of understatement. Uh, you undersold that all the way. Um, um, my friend Amish is with us. He was on the original cast, and we'll get to the recording in just in seconds. Uh, but Amish, do you, do you want to warn the listener, or do you, is there some sort of you know user's guide to this episode that you need to share? Sure. So at my lowest, when that existential anxiety sets in at 2 o'clock in the morning, when I worry that... I will be forgotten 100 years from now. Only two things covered me during those times. One, that my God knows my name. Second, that I was a part of something that will withstand the sands of time. No, not my kids, 
not my descendants. I'm talking about being on and taking part in creating that epic episode of Presbyterian Cast Theater 2000. And when the United States is a myth and reduced to a smoldering wasteland, they will dig up this podcast someday and read, Look upon my mighty works, you mighty, and despair. Well, you, you too are, are a master of understatement, I, I can see. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think we, we set the scene in the original content, which we'll roll uh, very soon. But anything else you want to say before we kick this masterpiece off? Just uh, this was the best thing that I've ever been a part of um, creatively. And it's just a good time. And I just know that you're going to enjoy it even if it's a second time listening to this. All right. Well, uh, well, let's just do it then. So uh, here we go. We're pretty traditionally Presbyterian. I love to call. I love to Must have a code. Oh, no doubt. You see, ladies, I'm not just a Presbyterian. I'm a Scottish old believer Presbyterian. Now he plants his footsteps on every way, and he lies every road. And when he speaks my name, or when the battle is tough, oh, I got Jesus, and that's enough. That's why. That's why. Hmm. I'm taking a, a moment. Uh, uh, I'm midway chewing through this uh, cheesy gordita crunch here with the abo sauce, and it occurs to me that we're on live radio. So um, this is the latest episode of Presby Cast. Yeah, you sound normal. Uh, that's the problem. It's almost like I'm full of it most of the time. Um, uh, I'm Presbyterian. That was Toro's Weekly. We actually have two guests. Um, and as we were joking about on the show before the show, um, things could be a lot better in terms of the show you're going to get. Um, but if it's any consolation, they couldn't get much worse. So um, let's go and get into this thing because this is a topic that really has been on the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, we get a lot of DMs about this particular issue. Um, it seems like it's it's been even more in recent weeks, given current events. So um, we decided to pull together the, the two best guests we could and, and talk about it. Um, we got started right on time, um, so we, we should have plenty of time before we all have to uh, fall down in our beds. So Because uh, we record these at night. So... Let's kick it off. Um, this is probably our, our most legitimately gospel issue podcast. Um, so let's get into it. Yeah, on a week when uh, you know we've had the Gospel Coalition, uh, Confab, and um, you know controversies with Doug Wilson um, and and nasty words that he's uh, said. Uh, what better to talk about than a fifty-year-old cheesy church musical? And um, that's what we're going to talk about. But I, I think maybe. From my perspective, I should call this uh, this show a few of my favorite things because I've got three of my favorite uh, people slash accounts uh, slash uh, virtual personages here. We've got uh, Amish Ambush, who is um, sort of our show ombudsman. He's been on before, consultant, uh, all around swell guy, and uh, we've also got um, s- someone who uh, joined us on a call in show. It was. Um, It was memorable. Uh, D-Bag Worship Guy. Uh, You Twitter people know him. And um, I don't think anyone could properly introduce him. Um, DB, why don't you just introduce yourself and and tell us how how awesome you are. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on the show tonight. I'm just kind of taking a break from, you know, 
my IPA binge and just kind of hanging out with you guys tonight. Um, I'm a very accomplished worship leader. I make all the right decisions. Um, I typically make most of worship about myself. I rarely have guests. Uh, I choose the right songs. I'm an Arcade Fire fan, and I'm emergent, and that's really all I can say right now. But I am glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you've you've graced us with your presence, and um, maybe we'll have time to talk later about how much your footwear costs. That's another thing we've learned this week, that there's a an Instagram account called Preachers and Sneakers, and uh, it's about how much um, some of these uh, big-time pastors spend on their clothing. Um, do you want to tell us anything about your um, um, fashion accessories or accoutrements? Well, I'm going to tell you this. I mean, I'm sure all of you have Prada sneakers, but if you do and you didn't opt for the alligator skin option, it's probably a waste of time. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, uh, we'll take that under advisement and uh, and keep that in mind. So um, I have sort of to introduce the very uh, uh, unusual thing we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Fifty years ago, um, an agency of the Southern Baptist Convention, and, um, and this was produced by a consultant to the Southern Baptist Convention, they produced uh, a musical, an, L- an LP, and this was not the only one, but it was called uh, Happening Now. And, um, you know, I was... Um, I was born in 65, so I missed uh, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar and Godspell, and we didn't really go for those things in my conservative Baptist uh, circles. Um, But um, this—we'll talk about this more as we go along. This points to the fact that the Southern Baptist Convention was a liberal denomination, at least at the top levels in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And uh, we'll hear that in this musical that we're going to hear tonight. Um, it's stunningly amazing in, on several levels, both from the, the content, the lyrics, uh, the context, the mu- the choice of um, oh, instrumentation and arrangement, and uh, just the whole package is uh, amazing. Uh, but it can teach us some lessons, but I think far more important, we might have a good time. Uh, listening to it and talking about it, so that's um, that's what we're going to do, and that's why we're here. And um, is this more like Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, or more like Starlight Express? Um, yeah, you know, I, I have to choose an Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> well, I, I tend to avoid Andrew Lloyd Webber, so I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll 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 all figure this out as we go along. So. Um, uh, DB, you've had some chances to listen to a little of this, and uh, you've you got to be pretty psyched and probably inspired by what you've heard. Well, as you know, I'm always very uh, vocal about things that I hate, so that's why I wanted to make <laughs> sure that I have time to come on this show tonight. Um, you know, I mean, it's just another opportunity to rip on ancient, so I'm in. <laughs> yeah, the, well, these, we uh, just want to we we want to be clear and we want to say thank you because we know that the the waiting list for your appearances is not short and and we're aware that we actually jumped names uh be, because of this so um if there's a if there's a word to the wise out there if you're trying to have the bag on the old show um bagging on bagging on the patriarchs is probably the way to do it we're going to smash the patriarchy honestly the the honor is all yours <laughs> <laughs> amen Yes, it is. So um, let's hear the opening number of this. Uh, again, you're going to hear some pops and cracks. And our, our friend Amish is a, a vinyl collector. Uh, he, he's used to this sort of thing. But uh, It's like when you take the headphone about halfway out and just kind of jiggle it a little bit. That's mm-hmm. the sensation you're supposed to have. <laughs> so the, uh, the audio is actually not bad. You'll not be able to make out all the words. Um, we've searched for a score to this. They're, I think they're out there, but we can't lay our hands on any. Uh, if you search, uh, if you do sort of an academic search, you find that almost every Southern Baptist mm. seminary has a copy of this thing. Um, and uh, so maybe some of you Baptists can uh, can go get it on interlibrary loan and uh, luxuriate in its uh, wonderfulness. But let's. Uh, um, okay, so some of our listeners are younger, so let's just say 1969, America's in the middle of uh, civil rights struggle, Vietnam War, all those things. Um, a lot of you younger guys— but At least we won both of those things. Sure. 
And um, a lot of younger people don't know that the Southern Baptist Convention was a liberal denomination at that time, prior to 1980, and um, not not rank and file, but at the uh, at the top levels, at the bureaucratic level, publishing, all that sort of thing. And uh, that's this is an attempt, and we always call out these attempts to be relevant and cool. This was a um, a high level attempt at uh, coolness, but you're going to see that they it's it's a scattershot thing. Every imaginable mu- musical style is here. Um, it probably cut in Nashville, so the musicianship is actually good, but the um, the singers are probably from you know First Baptist Nashville, Belmont College, um, really a Lawrence Welk sort of vocal vocal style uh, and type. But um, don't be su- Surprised by anything that you're about to hear, and um, you might want to keep small children away at first, uh, lest they be traumatized. But uh, the the name of it was. Now I should also say, in, in tribute to our friend Ed Stetzer, uh, the publisher of this piece was Broadman. Uh, does anyone know what Broadman morphed into? Life mm-hmm. Lifeway Christian Resources. Yes, mm-hmm. Lifeway. So as we learned that all Lifeway is shutting all their stores, we're going to hear one of their their great products of the past. So let's hear the opening well, number. Of, Go ahead. I was going to say one of my, um, to me, one of the great philosopher theologians, uh, a Dr. Ian Malcolm, once said that life finds a way. And uh, that was in his, uh, his you know, grand opus, Jurassic Park. So... Um, again, just because we can doesn't mean we should, but here we go anyways. Yeah. Well, didn't see that movie, believe it or not. So uh, let's hear the opening. No, we can believe it. Let's hear the opening number. It's a couple minutes long, and uh, everyone uh, enjoy. there you have it it's a new day and um just initial and i'm sure our our listeners have the ones who aren't in the ditch um are 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 stunned by this but uh db you're the worship uh, guy you're the music guy of course this is not meant for for church they may have been performed performed in church but it wasn't worship music but your initial reaction to this um this uh this thing A production experience. If I was producing that in a live setting, um, I probably would have grabbed um, the end of all of the XLR cables attached to the microphones and plugged them all into a plant on the stage <laughs> rather than the board. That would probably be my first reaction there. Um, so if we had not done that, what we heard is what we would get. So that, that's pretty much where I'm sitting with that one. Okay, so you went you went technical there. And uh, I missed the first couple of seconds, but that's okay because you've got much more to much more to add and to give. Um, 
Uh, again, I'm the oldest guy, so I was actually alive when this thing came out, but I was four years old. I remember a little bit of it. Grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, um, and I don't, you know, I, I do remember some visiting uh, youth groups who sang at the little church I went to, and it sounded a bit like this. And I also, I've seen a, the guy who produced this record is called Bob Oldenburg, O-L-D-E-N-B-U-R-G. Oh. Interesting. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I think when he moved to Nashville to work with the SBC, uh, he said one of the things that really inspired him was up with people. I'm not kidding. Uh, you get, you, I bet I bet Amish remembers up with people. Uh, it was horrible. It was um, it was something. So uh, uh, Amish as a uh, connoisseur of uh, vinyl era uh, records. What do you think here? So we got a uh, D-list version of the uh, Fifth Dimension, Age of Aquarius, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's it. Uh, when I when I think about sick bass lines, you know, I'm thinking about Roundabout by Yes. I'm thinking about uh, Dear Prudence by the Beatles. Um, this is the opposite of that. Like this is this is probably the worst bass lines that I've heard in my life. Now, these are probably Nashville session musicians. <clears throat> Terrible. Okay. Um, <laughs> Resby, um, what do you think the chances are that the uh, New Day in the WWE is going to adopt this as their entrance music? Well, see, it's interesting you say that because uh, New Day, as we know, originally had a um, sort of gospel choir style gimmick where mm. they had uh, the black robes and the clapping. That is before they started um, throwing pancakes into the crowd, sprinkling small children with cereal and riding on unicorns. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it, it, the tie in and the segue is obvious. Any Anyone with a brain can see it. Um, but, um, you know, I, I would... I would back it if, if, you know, Kofi comes into the main event of WrestleMania to this song rather than his uh, traditional one. I, I think it would be a good change. I, I'd call it a win. Now, one, one other observation I want to make is uh, one of the lyrics was uh, get with it and start grooving. It, it's just like, you know, wh- what do you call them? D-bag? Um, ancients? Absolutely. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to co-opt. You know, the younger generation's uh, linguistic style. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, this this stinks. But, you know, if we, we say grooving, maybe, maybe they'll get into it. Is it possible it's a uh, grooving on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon well, reference? Well, let me let me point out a line. There was something about going to the moon, which, you know, that happened in 69. Uh, Did it though? Something, yeah, something moon, and then ride a balloon. So that was just like you know, if you were young and crazy in the '60s, I guess you you went and rode a balloon, uh, and they were said it's a new day for riding the old wrongs. So as we listen to this, think about the context of the woke of the city fixers of the uh, the new socially concerned. Um, and, and we'll hear the word concern. Um, that, you know, we're the only people who are concerned. Um, there's some spoken words part parts that you'll you'll be able to understand very easily. Um, but uh, think about how similar some of the new emphases of evangelicalism are to what we'll hear here. So um, uh, is everybody ready to hear track two? Yes. I do have a track list, and the first one is called "It's a New Day." Believe it or not. The next one is yes, called is. The Communication Gap. So the, what was all the rage back then was to talk about the generation gap. In other words, uh, the young people can't understand the old people and vice versa. Uh, mm. So they take this and run with the communication gap. And uh, listen carefully because so it, it, at one point they'll say, um, I hear my pastor every week and then something inaudible. And then they say, his sermons leave me up a creek. So it's like open scorn for what they were getting at First Baptist of wherever. Uh, so I'm, this is them essentially ranting on their pastor on Facebook, but 50 years earlier through the secondary style of Nashville ses- session musicianship. So right, that's a, I mean, you got to admit it's they're ahead of their time. <laughs> well, and you know, this is a you know a 45 year old white guy who's producing this, so there's some irony Zuck- there. Zuckerberg should be paying him. Yeah. Well, let's hear track two, 
And um, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. So um, there was some point can there. We, can we go around the room and <laughs> ask each other what we think the um, the Bible line is? Because I, I was writing it down. Um, I, I also uh, this I I love this song. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, DB, what do you uh, what did you make of that number? I mean, it, it had sort of an impressive Motown start, and then it 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 kind of Lawrence walked out there, but what do you think? Well, I had two thoughts jump out at me. Um, one, this music is probably best understood by animals, infants, <laughs> and death. Um, <laughs> the second thought, if you know, I'm trying to kind of create an emergent comparison between like something modern to describe aptly this sound. I would say if the mentally challenged Beach Boys met ABBA in a collective somehow functional coma and somehow reported what happened, this may very well be exactly what happened at that time. That, that's what I would say. Is it like if Brian Wilson just never recovered? Yeah. <laughs> this is, I mean, this he's, is the he's, music he's, he would make. Right. It's, it's, well, I mean, it's the mentally challenged Beach Boys. <laughs> And they're meeting ABBA in a collective somehow functional coma. And it just, I mean, like, what, what would happen there? If this happened, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm feeling that this may be what happened. I'm just saying, I'm just putting oh. it out there. Putting it out I, I'll never be able to look at the record cover to pet sounds this thing again. <laughs> Hence, the music is best understood by animals, infants, and the deaf. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we're losing it here. And, uh, <clears throat> There you go. Well, um, well, thanks for that because I, I sure. wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought of all that. I, I'm, I'm trying to, to have input that matters here. That, that's why it's we. It's like he was hiding in plain sight. Yeah. Can Can I just say that the uh, the harmonica to the '60s is the sac what the saxophone was in the '70s? Like, oh, 100. Yeah. <laughs> percent. It's It's like uh, Roxy music comes on the scene in the '70s and introduces the saxophone to to the rock scene, and. Uh, by the time you get to city to city, Jerry Rafferty, like it is just in every single, you know, 70s song. And, uh, the, I think the harmonica is worse. Like it is just terrible. Well, there's the thing with the harmonica is there's a distinct genre into which the harmonica can be played and work. And this wasn't that genre. <laughs> um, Seconded. So. well, there's more to come on this. Uh, I assure you. Okay. Well, I 
I love, I was trying to like write down the lyrics as I heard them, especially after the chortles challenge uh, of what was inaudible. And, and before we even got to the, like, he reads the Bible every week line. I, I liked the like, Hey, preach, stop your berating something, something I'm for communicating, um, which is, it's poetry. And the gap um, grows wider. We heard that. And the gap grows wider still. Yeah. Um, but I think it's he reads the Bible every week. No, I, I hear my pastor. He I Bible. hear my pastor every week. His sermons. I, okay, leave I hear me, my pastor every week. His sermons leave me up a creek. But I think the line in between is he reads the Bible from both feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be. Could He's be. a respectable gentleman. He's standing while reading God's word. You know. So uh, the song's called "Happening Now." So what's what's happening to me happening to me now at this point when I first heard this when when uh, Turtle sent it to me was uh, I was wanting to turn it off and off myself. Well, we're glad you did. It's <laughs> it's, it's, it's wrong, wrong to do that to yourself. So um, all right, well, I think we need to compose ourselves. So we'll do that. Uh, that was uh, the communication gap. Um, we're going to hear happening now now which is i guess sort of the uh, the title tune and you're going to hear um some of the themes picked up and and uh, consolidated in later numbers but uh let's hear number three i'm actually scared <laughs> Something is happening, we're in the race, cause the engine 
can there be any doubt that it's happening or that it was happening or something? So, um, uh, Amish, I'm going to ask you first this time. What do you say? Uh, I still don't know what's happening now. (laughs) Okay. Um, Although I do like the line, uh, science is trying to, to help us survive. That's uh this is like that's deep. This is like the other end of the spectrum from like extremely first wave black metal. <laughs> um where it, where it's like so lo fi and like the guitars are so razored that you can't hear anything over the vocals that are so distorted. This is the other end of that spectrum. So where it's just it's a constant falsetto yes. for six minutes. Um I hate to say it because there's still a lot of good stuff, but it like strikes you like the first time. Um, like if you're, if you're, if you're listening to the grateful dead and like the first time you hear the female backing vocals on like playing in the band and you're just like, Whoa, that is not the version that they played in the sixties. Um, this is not the music that you've ever listened to before ever. Now, I, I do want to say, you know, like listening to the song, I was instantly transported to a Kmart <laughs> when I was four years old, walking. It's got to be the walking down the, the aisle, aisle, right? Just just walking down the aisle, and this was the type of music that was playing over the speaker while my parents were shopping at the broken down Kmart in Barberton, <laughs> Ohio. Hmm. Well, I will say that the vocal style, that overdriven, uh, soprano heavy. Um, style that was the style that every Southern Baptist church choir was shooting for. I mean, I actually in the nineties um, sang in a Southern Baptist choir, and that's that's pretty much what they were shooting for. They nobody could pull that off. Um, but is that there was, a soundboard recording of that? No, no, anyway? no, 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 no. So, uh, a DB, uh, I know you're all about production values. Um, even uh, I know enough to know that this mix was not not terribly flattering to the uh, to the song, um, but just uh, your reaction. First reaction: How did they clone that many Sandy Patties? Secondly, <laughs> let me let me tell you what's happening here. Okay, they're hurting music's feelings. <laughs> okay, and I have to be honest with you as as the main representative of music worldwide, it offends my soul. And, and I'm going to be straight up with you. My soul hole feels violated right now. That, that's mm. where I'm at. My, my soul is, is really, really hurting because this, it has the lyrical variety of the Beyonce songs chorus on endless repeat. Um, it says something is happening. And. But something we, is happening. We don't know what it is other than. It's happening. Sandy Patty voices in a horrible, horrible cacophony of just complete head voice nonsense. I, I really don't know what to do with that. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't really comment. Uh, well, um, and that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not even DB. I'm not even sure what shoe gaze is, but you, you got to think about when these guys are looking down at their shoes, they're probably white patent leather and they can probably see themselves in it. Alligator skin Prada shoes, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's what you um, wear. Oh, of course. Yes. But I mean, I mean, doesn't everybody? But the the thing is, you know, th- this is shoe gaze in the sense that you really can't look up to see real life because of what's going on. I mean, it's 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 really, it's really really bad. And I understand that music was every. I mean, this music was everywhere in that time. But so were many horrific rampant diseases. So that really doesn't say much about it at all. You know, I mean, I. I I'm having a problem processing it. I think we need to go to the next track. Yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> here's the thing, though. I mean, this came out in, what, 1969? Yep. Is it any surprise that the 1970s were also the most violent decade in American history? Oh, yeah. This this uh, was definitely going to pacify the populace. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, th- this, is what, this is what it needed. Um you know, if someone had just given this musical to the son of Sam, so much hurt could have been avoided. I mean, this. Well, it gets <sighs> you thinking philosophically. I mean, it, you, you ask the age old question when you listen to music like this. Do I listen to Christian music because I'm miserable or am I miserable? because I listen to Christian? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, let's be honest here. Excellent point. Uh, how, how do you think Arcade Fire would cover a, a musical like this? Like if they were going to do their own rendition? Um, I think they probably wouldn't do it, most likely. Um, if they did, I think it would probably be just Wynn and a ukulele. Um, you know, I don't know if his if his wife would even sing on something like that. So, I, I, but I mean, Win would make it great. So, you know, that's how it works. Well, let's uh, we will move on to the next one. Um, this is where it takes even even odder turn. Um, basically, you, there's a contrast being set up here between the um, the victims and the with it young people who have concern and everyone else. Uh, everyone 30 or older, uh, everyone uh, who's in leadership at their church. And um, we're going to hear the voice of, um, it's a little confusing. Um, it's maybe a middle, middle American, and they seem to be happy that the worst things aren't happening where they are. But then they talk about some of the bad things that are happening. So you just have to listen to it. Uh, so it is continuing to happen is what yeah. we've established. It's a muddled a muddled message and um takes a weird stylistic turn here so let's hear track four and it's called ain't happening here so so happening now to ain't happening here wherever the 60s he, were such a confusing time yeah, wherever here is here we go You'll find it ain't happening here There ain't no headlines here Cause it ain't happening here Just poverty and misery happening here you go that's uh ain't happening here and um this is uh it, it's a little confusing to me but what did what did you guys make of the uh uh the singer and the song and uh, the perspective uh, that we see here with this number anyone i'm seeing um Someone hit Sam Cook in the head with a baseball bat and starts reading random lines from a prosperity gospel book, probably written by someone like Stephen Furtick or Beth Moore. That's what I'm getting out of that song. Well, that's that's one way to look at it, uh, and no doubt um, it it it's uh, it's sort of the forgotten America that I think that they're portraying. Um, of course, the big headlines at, at this time were you know Bobby Kennedy getting shot and. Uh, the Tet Offensive and things like that. So, I think they're talking about a range of uh, of lesser problems that uh, are escaping the um, the attention of most of America. Um, I would I would point out I could wait till the end to do this, but uh, 
there is no gospel at any point in any of this thing. And um, uh, it's, well, it is an SBC production. Well, uh, you know that that was not the case in the in the, the smaller churches and many churches, but um, at the at the top level, again, um, it was a social gospel thing, and that's what we're hearing here. What do we, what do we think? Dare I say, is happening with the line back on the back page? You'll find it ain't happening here. Well, I think it said that the you know these problems are not front page news. You guys are all too old to remember, too young to remember newspapers. Uh, but new, it's news that didn't make the front page. Uh, poverty, uh, misery, loneliness; those things were not considered newsworthy, like the big splashy events like uh, ironically these are all things we will experience after finishing this musical <laughs> um, probably so um so uh, i'm uh, sort of hoping it was like an ode to craigslist like the misconnections page or something so amish any um any uh, thoughts here so is this what uh stockholm syndrome feels like is this <laughs> like the uh fourth time that i've had to listen to this and uh i'm just like oh yeah this one like oh yeah okay uh, the harmonica is back. Yes, uh, yes, in, in full force. And uh, I will just say that uh, good music ain't happening here. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I told you this was. Can a, I jump in one ahead. more analogy? Yes, sir. This is this is like um, Matt Damon in the movie The Martian, where all he wants to do is listen to music, but the only music that was left in his uh, Mars space station was his co-worker's disco records. Mm. So he sort of just has to try to find the, the least disco of all the disco records, and I feel like that's this song. I, I can get behind that as well. <laughs> okay. Well, so, you know, on a serious note, um, to set up this set up the next song, uh, the, you know, the Vietnam War was going on. Uh, that was a bad thing. Uh, I remember... MIA bracelets. Uh, I don't. I don't remember where you bought them, but everybody at school had these bracelets, and it was to co- commemorate people who were lost and POWs missing in action, that sort of thing. Uh, it was a tragic time. Uh, the Vietnam War was just a a nasty thing, and the home front was nasty. Um, but because of how bad it was, you would think that someone trying to make art off of this would be sensitive, but this next number, uh, I wonder how it was received by some of the people who heard it. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, you're just going to have to hear this one. And I, I, what, what you're hearing is a kind of a theoretical conversation between an army wife and her husband who's going off to Vietnam. Um, but they, it's, it's set in a very strange way. And, um, again, you're just going to have to hear it. And, um, that's what you're that's what you're going to do now so we're going to hear it
God, no. No. Oh, stupid, ugly world. Why? You slaughter your future and teach children to kill. the inappropriate harmonica. So, um, you know, I think I figured this out. This is uh, the next to last song on the side one of this LP. <laughs> Good you, grief. <laughs> you, you, you young people don't, uh, don't know that there's, you know, there was, there was something important about the first side of the album and the second. Usually all the good stuff was on the first side. But anyway... Uh, the, the first side is a setup of all those problems in society. Now, I think we can say that this was handled pretty ham-handedly. This song is a problem of society. <laughs> so, uh, fair enough. Um, but uh, this was an anti-war song, clearly. Um, and that's fine. I'm, I'm not saying you should have been should have thought the, world, the Vietnam War was a great thing. But this does seem to be a rather insensitive and um, uh, brutal way to handle it. So, uh, but... Uh, but maybe our our musical expert thinks it's a great piece of uh, music and a fine performance. So, what do you think, DB? I'm going to be honest with you. I covered this song last week for Offering. Um, I did it in in a duet with a schnauzer with Perfect Pitch, and I I really have no problem with the song whatsoever. Well, that's it's good. It's uh, it's that it sounds it sounds interesting. It was it was very very good. I, th- I think we actually did it better than the original. So I mean, this particular piece of music I think was very well executed. It had it had talking in it. I mean, it was it was serious, um, and, and it's great to cover with a schnauzer with perfect pitch. I, th- I think we're in, so I like it. Yeah, well, voice acting is not easy, and this this song proves it, and uh, some other ones will prove it uh, down the line on side two. Um, so you know, it, it it strikes me if if what you knew about the Vietnam War was this song and Apocalypse Now, you'd probably be a, a little confused. Um, it makes Apocalypse Now out to be an upper. <laughs> oh boy! So um, why why Platoon didn't choose to play this instead <laughs> of All Along the Watchtower or Fortunate Son? Like I, I don't understand. You know, this is perfect Vietnam jungle music. Yes, it's very, very evocative. Um, I sometimes, uh, I don't, I'm not ashamed to admit, uh, pr- probably just to criticize it, I watched the Lawrence Welk show every now and then. Uh, as a child, it was on. It was ubiquitous. My, my grandparents would watch it. And uh, I remember being kind of confused by it, and I still am. But uh, that's I guess that's one of the reasons I watch it now. But the musical style here is very much Lawrence Welk in many ways. Um, so I'm, know. I'm just impressed with the, uh, ink spots type, uh, sing talking at the end of the song without the talent or skill. That's, that, that was impressive. Yep. So this was the best and brightest of, uh, of, uh, evangelicalism. In I mean, that. you can just, you can just see the yellow taxi pulling up to your house to deliver that, that envelope and, I mean, it's it, above all, it's an extremely respectful song of uh, of things that people were going through. Yeah. All right. Well, so the next oh, the next song is even more. <laughs> oh, it's gosh. more. It's it's more of a downer. And uh, <laughs> we're uh, we're here to entertain ourselves. And to those that have not turned we off the podcast, failing. we are failing. <laughs> those who have not turned off the podcast by now, you're a weirdo. Go home. So, <laughs> the offensive thing about the next one, and you're, I'm going to point this out, so maybe you'll hear, the, you'll understand the lyrics. Um, it's about a a dying uh, a mother with a, a poor mother with a dying child, obviously in a city, and 
And, this and, is pre Keller, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, and she's referred to as like a dying Madonna. So that's oh, that's Mary, okay? <laughs> and her child. I mean, we hear about some of the woke people talk about the the power of redemptive suffering, unearned suffering, the redemptive power of unearned suffering. That's exactly what this song is. But there's no Christ in it. Um, the 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 religious figures in this song are the mother and the child. And it's supposed to be some parallel with Jesus and Mary, and it just doesn't quite work. And, you know, the 70s were, were kind of rough, but I don't think we had people starving in the streets. Um, but we need, to, we need to hear this one. And uh, this is the end of side one, and this is setting up um, how bad everything was. And uh, we can say is, if we believe people today. But uh, uh, let's hear track six. Through streets of dark shadow, she walks where none follows, mother and child all alone. Like a tragic Madonna, she cradles a dying child, singing a sad lullaby. Okay, is everyone still with us? Unfortunately. Oh, okay. I thought we'd lost a couple. Um, so there you have it. Uh, that's the end of side one, and that's the setup for, um, well, you would think it was um, the setup for some sort of redemption, but as you'll hear, there's not really any uh, redemption put forth or uh, posited, except we need to get moving and do stuff. And feel differently. This is a very feeling-oriented thing, as uh, evangelicalism generally is. Even, well, even especially I need, the liberal sort. I need you to isolate the sound bites of you saying "feel better," <laughs> do things. Um. <laughs> I can do that. So, uh, so DB, um, I'm sure you're given to to pathos and uh, creating a certain mood and feeling in your music. How do you think they they did with that in this case? It's like a pseudo demonic version of Evita performed by someone who enjoys hurting other people orally and lyrically and emotionally and spiritually and sonically. That's what I would say. I think. Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's helpful and fair. I good, think. good, good, good. Yeah, and um, uh, well, you know, Amish, you're closer to my age. Is this evocative of, I don't know, some of the... Um, Baroque the, the, rock? Yeah, sappy songs. Like I the mean, Beatles in my life, <laughs> like with the harpsichord, right? Yeah, you know, one of the things that, of course, not the musical style, but I remember as a child being pretty troubled by the um, 
the theme song to the Poseidon av- Adventure. Oh, I remember that. Oh yeah, the, oh yeah, the, yeah. Great and, movie. Uh, but there the was first just, one. there was lots okay, of um, lots of very maudlin stuff in the seventies, and um, maybe it helped people deal with how bad things were. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure about that. Well, it would help people deal with how bad things were because of how bad it is. <laughs> so I do understand that very much. I mean, it's very relevant and it's obvious to put one and two together like that. It's like if you're, I mean, it's a, yeah, if you're sad, a sad song makes you feel better sometimes. Absolutely. How were you? Absolutely. Your sentences are coming from inside my head. How did you do that? <laughs> oh. I was going to say the exact same thing. Like a happy song has never made me happier, <laughs> but a sad song has made me happy because then you're like, well, at least I'm not that guy. I think this uh, song makes a great companion piece to the uh, Decemberist song, Leslie Ann Levine. Like if you if you played this song and then that song, like it just makes sense. So any of you music is- nerds. Leslie Ann Levine is is that like Avril Levine's mom or something? <laughs> it's like a ghost baby song, so it's like you know the child's dying in my arms, and then Leslie Ann Levine would be. Was this know. the skater boy that Avril Levine is thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> wow! Relevant, relevant. I would say that it makes a good companion piece to something you're going to throw in the trash. <laughs> Well, you know, they're obviously shooting for sort of the uh, the pathos of Coventry Carol or uh, John Dowland's "Flow My Tears," but um, I don't know the the the, the faux harp the faux harps accord maybe maybe uh, poorly played there. So the only thing worse would be a real one. <laughs> it could have been a real one. Who, who knows? So, um, well, let's let's move along. Um, we're we're getting into side two. And uh, but before we get into the um, well, there's not really not much prescription for what to do, but uh, there's going to be the next track. You're going to shudder when I say this. It's entitled "Hymn to Rebellion," <laughs> and it seems to it seems to it's be just about a straight Green Day cover. <laughs> Rage against the machine. We're going to hear it, right? It seems to be just sort of a tip of the cap to the hippies and the counterculturalist and the uh, adherents of Eastern religion. There's something about the Zodiac. Um, it's paganism. Ted Cruz gets a shout out. But it's almost like <laughs> it's it's almost like they're saying they're pagans, but they make some good points. You know, that's that's sort of what I take from this. So um, like Trent Reznor. Yeah. <laughs> So so let's hear it, and uh, maybe this is the one that I, I understand the fewest words in, um, but it, it, it's 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 disturbing and creepy. So we got to hear it. Great, what is ours now and 
Well, this is your old uh, radio, internet radio friend, uh, Brad Chortles. Uh, back in 2022, here at uh, a special halftime interlude uh, for this uh, stunning piece of uh, uh, late 60s Christian music. Um, Amish, uh, your thoughts? Uh, well, so I heard that there was a, a piece in Rolling Stone about a oral history about the making of this album, and I just... You know, you're you are the expert at, you know, the what happened when they were producing this album. Uh, is it true that during it's happening now, the singers were kicking each other in the bread basket between takes to achieve those high C soprano mega levels? Um, and then when they were singing the lyric, it's happening now, they were describing how they felt. After they were getting kicks in the breadbasket. Well, it's I, I guess it's reasonably plausible now that you mention it. Um, it it's pretty stunning. It's uh, pretty amazing. Um, it, it speaks for itself. And um, I think the commentary coming up at, as we will fade back into this song and it'll end. Um, lots of discussion of the, of the questionable lyrics on this one. So... Any warnings you want to issue to the listener for the uh, the rest of the of the second half here? Well, I'm just gonna say like the commentary gets better and the songs get worse. Um, but what really amazes me during this whole thing is like you grew up with this. This was kind of normal for you, like you know the 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 high soprano, high C stuff. Like that was the pinnacle of this kind of music, and I. I feel sorry for you. All right. Well, uh, I think we, you know, this is going to, this runs for a while. So I think we need to, uh, I think we need to get back into it and hear, um, well, part two. Well, as the young cool people say, weird flex, but okay. Um, Amish is especially moved by this one. Um, Amish. Seventh son of a seventh son. I love that. <laughs> so so we got a sitar. We definitely got a, a, a chroma harp in there, which is which is pretty awesome. And uh, I don't know what acid drop kicks are, but I want some of that. <laughs> Uh, I think it's but, when the, it, didn't you say when the acid drop kicks in? Is it uh, sort of like when the bass drops? I, uh, I like acid drop kicks. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, DB, what, what's an acid drop kick, please? That's a genre of music, actually. Uh, we do it pretty much every week. Um, it, it's pretty great. Well, I thought you would know. So, um, um, uh, th- again, I picked up a few snatches of, of meaning there. Um, Resby, you do have any thoughts about, um, about the, about the, um, uh, all the words and the images in this one? Well, I mean, it's no wonder the Beatles hippie stage sucked so bad. They could never compare to something as good as this. Her. Um, they really should have just, you know, never come to America instead. Um, I mean, again, I love the Ted Cruz imagery of the Zodiac. Um, I think it was a really nice touch. Um, to kind of to kind of throw that in there, um, the sitar did stand out to me. Like it kind of comes in there, and you're like, "Oh, I, I want to know." Like, did the session session musician who got to play the sitar for this did he ever get to hear the finished product of like of what his um, like what his musicianship went towards? And listen to me now. I'm just assuming genders here. What uh, his or her musicianship uh you know might might have gone towards so um i i i hope so um i it's just it's hard not to think about how many bands probably got inspiration from music like this that you know we would later consider to be you know leviathans of rock mm, and roll mm, mm. 
George, George Harrison's fault. The sitar. Well, uh, again, it, this is what it this is what it is and was what it was and make of it what you will. So they, again, they did um, they did sort of say hippies, uh, you're out there, you got a point. Um, I think they were talking about the goddess of love and. I don't know. I don't know what that was all about, but um, it, it it could have made sense in 1969, probably eight, but not nine, since we're always behind. So this is like the phenomena of the uh, the cool dad, cool mom. <laughs> yeah, if you like, can see the picture of Bob Oldenburg, I mean he's he looks like a Baptist guy. So, but he he was super cool. I hear you, hippies. <laughs> well, it's sort of like you know when when like you see names of like old baseball players, and you're like, you were born to be a baseball player. Like Bob Oldenburg <laughs> was born <laughs> to do this. <laughs> um, it was written in the stars. <laughs> yes, yeah, the seventh, natural law calls out to this seventh sign of the zodiac. Well, the next one is. Um, can, can I give a? Do you mind if I, I put my two cents in? Please? Certainly. I'm Three, sorry to you know. interrupt, but I just want to say, um, I'm not trying to offend, but you know, this is not the most PC explanation, but I'm hearing kind of a female retarded Seager Rose collective with a lyrical <laughs> Iron Maiden reference and a Chinese opium den, uh, with a guest appearance by a bunch of guys who can't sing plus a sitar. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm only giving props to the sitar. Um, if a song could embody the horror of Yoko Ono's aura, this would be the song. <laughs> That's my two cents. Okay, well, that was like a, a nickel. Um, <laughs> I'm dying here. I can't. I can't. My, my computer screen it. is covered in my own saliva. <laughs> yeah, Resty, when you laugh, back off from the mic a little bit because you and DB are on the same channel. I'm uh, sorry, you can't. Yeah, I'm just listening to a man speak his truth and worshiping. Okay, right. ask him to lift a car over his head. It's impossible. <laughs> So it is time to move to the next number, and it's called. And I think, and I think we're all feeling this now. It's called "What Can I Do." So this is we don't uh, know. this is someone. I, I just want to say before we do this, I know that we have a lot of listeners who listen to our show at sped up paces, as in like one and a half, sometimes two times speed. Um, I'm starting to see your point. No, no. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the next number, I think it, I think, it, and I've listened to all this several times, but I, it's all blurring together now. I think it's meant to portray the exasperation of someone who says, what can I do uh, with all these, all this terrible music? I guess that's what it means. Uh, but let's hear, uh, what can I do? Well, 
Sometimes we care. Yeah, send our money. Christmas baskets, toys for kids. But who really cares about people? pretty much alone in this thing called concern, or so we're informed. And I should have mentioned, and I forgot, this pulled together the the themes of the some of the earlier songs. Um, but uh, this is probably the most cringeworthy from a, from a lyrical standpoint. We're pretty much alone in this thing called concern. Uh, someone must do something. Uh, it, it occurs to me that since this was a liberalizing Arminian denomination, the doctrine of total depravity might have come in handy. Um, there might not have been such um, shock and surprise at the state of the world, but uh, that's that's my thoughts. Um, let me say, from a Southern Baptist perspective, uh, they're belittling uh, you know Christmas offerings and. Um, Things like that, and that was really striking at the heart of um, Southern Baptist Mission, which was the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Um, so they were pretty much cutting the knees out from under under uh, the whole uh, Southern Baptist program. But um, uh, Amish, uh, you being second oldest, I'm sure this is a little a little familiar to you at some at some level. Well, I've uh, I've brought this up. Uh before, but uh, Hoppy Jones from the Ink Spots, he would be the guy that would talk in the middle of of every Ink Spot song, and uh, he's rolling over in his grave right now. Like this is this is terrible. Um, we got some some uh, Moody Blues before the Moody Blues really came on the scene, so uh, I'm thinking maybe the Moody Blues listened to this and then was uh. like, oh, th- this is a good. And and guys, there's not a bigger Moody Blues fan than than myself, but this is amazing. It's like, the, like, but who really cares about people, one character asks. That's right. To which I answer, not us, because we continue <laughs> to play these songs. Uh, that's fair. Uh, so, uh, DB, you've, you've got you've to say this is an impressive uh, weaving together of the earlier themes and a very a courageous and edgy employment of the harpsichord once again. So, musically, what do you got on this one? I have several thoughts. Theologically, the song itself is total depravity, so they nailed that one. <laughs> um, secondly, this song embodies everything you shouldn't do when considering counter melodies. Thirdly, how did they get Sandy Patty to sing on every song? Fourthly, the talking parts were actually making me hope the wah, wah, wah from Charlie Brown teacher would be coming in soon to make the talking stop. I'm going to be honest with you. I was waiting for it. it um, so, you know, th- that's pretty much where I'm at with that song. Um, do you have any thoughts considering those statements? Uh uh, if this no. was the floor of GA, I would scream a second from anywhere in the room. <laughs> um, it, it explains a few things. Um, you know, here's the deal. This was put out by Broadman. You know, they they you know the Southern Baptist hymnal was the Broadman hymnal. Uh, still today, most PCA churches they get their uh, little communion cups. And their their communion wafers from Broadman. It's still a brand of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, now, of course, they've multiplied brands uh, in the last few decades. But uh, That's crazy! I didn't under- I didn't realize that Dennis Rodman made hymnals. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's for the. It was before uh, he got. It was before he got drafted. That's for the, oh, okay. well, that's for the Southeast Asia anyway, mission. So. Yeah, that's for oh, the great. mission to Southeast Asia. 
North uh, Korea. Uh, Rodman, yes. Um, so this is what became Lifeway. Um, and so I'm wondering about the distribution on this. Did Talk church, about peaking too early. Yeah. Did, did churches buy this record and play it for youth groups? Did, oh, um, and, and there used to be, before there was Lifeway, there was something called um, the um, the Baptist Sunday School Store. I think that's what it was called. The Baptist Bookstore. Sure no, I'm sure they didn't hawk anything. It was called the Baptist Bookstore. When I was a kid and we would go to the big city of Memphis, they had one there. And sometimes my mom would want to stop because she could get stuff for her Sunday school classes or whatever. Um, so did they sell them directly to people? Did they people buy this on purpose? Did it get was was one copy mailed to every church? Um, it's hard to understand, but imagine yourself as a Southern Baptist teenager in a mid-sized Southern city, and somehow this came into your possession, and you put this on the record player in November of 1969. What was your reaction? DB, I'll bet you can imagine what their reaction might have been. Oh, man. I mean, a combination of sheer horror, um, apocalyptic plagues. I, I can't even imagine. I really can't. Nuclear holocaust. I don't know. I don't know. I, I will say that I uh, looked this up on Discogs before uh, the show. And uh, you can get a uh, very good copy for 25 bucks and there's one on there for 40. So I'm going to imagine um, the immediate reaction was taking it and just breaking it over, over knees. And there's so little of them now you have to pay 25 bucks to get this, this copy. So, I mean, if, effectively, is this the star Wars holiday special of <laughs> Southern Baptist music? Um, is, is that what it's come to? like? Would Al Mohler secretly like to destroy every physical copy of this left in existence? Well, but, but again, back to what I said at the beginning, this is boomer stuff. So the people who are 10 years older than me now, they, they were the people listening to this. So you're saying Al Mohler still listens to this regularly? I don't know, but Tim Keller, Al Mohler, John Piper, although he would, growing up IFB. He and, doesn't uh, listen to music. You know, in South Carolina, growing up at IFB, he wouldn't have heard this, but um, but now he makes cheesy um, you know, animated poems and uh, uh, movies and um, all that. So, if Okay, so if I was... And, and I'm talking to especially she with this comment. But if I went to the lookout with like the dude I was running steady with and he puts this on in the car, I would hope the bright encircling python would choke me even faster. <laughs> like that thing could not constrict fast enough for me. Um, just oh. so, so another observation I have on this uh, particular recording is that uh, there's a lot of clicks and pops on this particular song. So this was a song that was played a lot. Like somebody was like, "Oh, this is the free bird of this album." Like they no, they, they were that was when <laughs> they were just acid drop kicking the record player. I like where this is headed. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. You know, it, it did occur to me that that the record was worn, and um, you wonder why. Maybe they had a cat. So. Don't know. It's got to pee on something. <laughs> so, uh, on that note, we'll, we'll we'll get to the next uh, we'll get to the next number, and it's called now this. Okay, so me, Resby, Amish, anyone who's uh, not not partic- you know with it, but not particularly woke. This next song is about us. Uh, we are we. It, this is about the country club. Uh, of course, white guy and uh, the upper middle class guy. That's what this next song is about, and it's um, it's pretty stunning, and uh, as all, as they all are. So let's hear. Uh, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved. And my friend On myself I depend That's all That's the end Oh yeah I'm satisfied with things right now Why change them all around anyhow I'm saying I I don't wanna get involved There's 
Just one thing that I want to know. What's the matter with the status quo? This involvement, it's just gotta go. Oh, yeah. I'm satisfied with things right now. Why change them all around anyhow? I'm saying I, I don't want to get involved. I don't care about the folks next door. It's not my fault they're sinking lower and lower. Want some food? So let them loot a store. Oh, yeah. I'm satisfied with things right now. Why change them all around anyhow? I'm saying I, I don't want to get involved. Lonely people, well, why should I care? It's not my problem. I've got friends to spare. Try to love them, man. I wouldn't dare. Oh, yeah. I'm satisfied with things right now. Why change them all around anyhow? I'm saying I, I don't want to get involved. Man, I'm absolved. I'm saying I, I don't want to get involved. My problem solved. I'm saying I. No, oh yeah. Um, so God, that, I, it's a it's a pretty transparent. Uh, it's pretty obvious where, where this uh, song's going. But let me just say before I forget, um, this is essentially what um, this is Tim Keller's Idols of the Heart. Um, this is um, this is about people guilty for having stuff and being well off. I think, and I don't know. It's um, it's it you can you can hear this in any era um and there's a there's a clear religious this is not just a, a secular thing uh man i'm absolved uh that's the what the speaker says at some point um and of course it's sort of a dixie land uh and you can you can almost imagine tap dancing on the on the lawrence welk show Okay, I'm glad you said the breaks there. Um, I'm glad you said tap dancing because as soon as I heard the phrase "I don't want to get involved," the only thing I could think about was I think it was back in the late '90s when the Warner Brothers Network, also known as the WB, used to have a do the Michigan (laughs) rock. Yes, but like the the WB Network would have like the tap dancing frog on the WB Michigan J Frog. Yes, it fits exactly with, I don't want to get involved. <laughs> like, it's the same song. They just ripped it off. You're stealing my network. thunder, Resby. <laughs> the Everybody to- do the Michigan <laughs> rack. <laughs> okay, well, y- 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 Resby. This uh, is like, if, if, um, if Siegfried and Roy made a worship album, this would be it. Okay, so, DB, bring some sanity to this. Um, I'm sure... I'm sure you're all about contextualization and trying to appeal to various age groups and, and cultures in your church. So um, how do you think they did on that score? Do you want me, do you want me to be honest with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you typically are. Speak your okay. truth. I'm four IPAs in, okay? I'm going to be honest with you here. <laughs> Scott Joplin on heroin <laughs> hires a church burnout to sing an off-Broadway-esque diatribe on genuinely not giving a crap about idiots that dig their own grave. Props for the overusage of triplets. This song speaks to my soul, and it speaks to my way of life. I'm overlooking scandals. I'm overlooking bad doctrine slash theology. It's absolutely timeless. I'm in. I like it. <laughs> it slaps, in other words. It slaps. Oh, it slaps. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> On the WB. <laughs> um, I'm kind of seeing a cartoon duck tap dancing. I love it. I mean, oh, I just I think it, it just really spoke to me. In the SBC. <laughs> I can just see Al Moeller, like that picture where he's like lifting up his uh, slacks to show off his socks, just kind of like tap dancing into a breakout session. Like this needs to be his entrance music. Well, this is a good time to be fair to, to say that um, 
in 1980, the conservatives uh, sort of uh, took control decisively of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, you know, Southern Seminary in Louisville was a very liberal seminary uh, prior to to Moeller's arrival. So he hasn't. He's done some good things, but um, we don't have to. We don't have to particularly like him, and um, and that's why we give him a hard time, I guess. But um, so things changed. Uh, I think if you were a Southern Baptist in the country, um, you could have a fairly conservative, normal revivalist sort of uh, culturally conservative church that had a high regard for the Bible, or at least professed one. Maybe in practice, didn't give the Bible its due. But um, but there was another part of the Southern Baptist world that was almost indistinguishable from uh, the other mainline churches. The SBC was a mainline uh, church at that time. Uh, so, you know, things changed after this, and I think we can see why uh, they, they needed to change uh, if this was um, if this was what was driving the bus, but. I think a lot of the people in in the bureaucracy of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention didn't leave, and there's always been this pragmatism, this sort of uh, um, uh, unsophisticated culturalism in the Southern Baptist Convention, and uh, that's one that's that's a lesson to take from this. Um, how silly you can end up looking. Um, I'm sure to the current generation at that time, but certainly to those. Those of us fifty years later trying to make sense of this, uh, this uh, a, you know ecclesiastical entertainment uh, train wreck. So, uh, it, I mean, it always goes back to like somewhere there was someone sitting at the soundboard in the studio while these guys are just laying down the tracks, and his head is nodding, and he's just like, "Yes, we're doing it. This is it," and like the band looks out from inside the recording glass and he just gives the double thumbs up. Like this is killer. And I, I just wish that we had those moments on film. I wonder if Bruce Dickinson was involved at any point from Iron Maiden. No, no. <laughs> the oyster cult. He told them by the time they'll be leaving here, they'll be wearing gold plated diapers. <laughs> <laughs> well, the song is like harking back to the, the roaring twenties. So I mean, you got this like mustache twirling, like I'm burning dollar bills, letting them a cigar, like you know. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the old flapper service style. <laughs> Cross between Raleigh Fingers and George Burns. <laughs> I'm gonna tie you to this railroad track. See. Ah, <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, that just you know there was a thrill about this. I'm sure they thought we're going to make a difference. Because we're speaking in the language of the culture, not just the young people. But again, you had a shared culture still in this country. Um, everybody watched the Lawrence Welk show. You know, everybody watched the endless uh, parade of variety shows. And on a variety show, you would have about as much range on a variety show as you would on, on this record. And there were only three three networks. So everybody watched everything. So younger people were used to tolerating some of this square stuff, I think. And um, they they really thought they were going to make change the world. And um, by, by appealing to people on this cultural uh, entertainment base level, and they were going to move people to do something, we're not quite sure. Uh, there's only three numbers left. The next one is also... Sort of a, eh, I don't feel like doing anything. It's no big deal. And then they've only got two numbers left, and there's real, there's no real solution. But uh, I think we're not going to be surprised that this record does not really resolve at the end. But let's hear, let's hear the next track, uh, number ten, called "Tomorrow." <laughs> Tomorrow, tomorrow is soon enough to worry, hurry. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll have more time to care and to share. All my time is taken up by things 
things I have to do. Got to get my education, recreation too. Tomorrow will give me a chance to do what I can do. Other things will have to wait at least till I am through. Tomorrow, tomorrow is soon enough to take a stand. Be a man. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll get involved with my fellow man. Problems, problems everywhere. Well, I've got problems too. No one tries to understand or see things as I do. When I get myself straightened out, then I'll do something too. While I will simply watch, but I will pray for you. Tomorrow. Oh yeah, I'll pray for you. I'm not going to do anything, but I'll pray for you. So this seems to be uh, directed at those who uh, they agree that there are problems, but they can't be bothered to do much. Uh, those people happen to also be the number one donors to the uh, Southern Baptist Convention, I'm sure. Um, but uh, at any rate, this uh, DB, um, I think this might have made a good theme song for a um, for an Aaron Spelling production of some kind. What do you think? I think maybe more for a Tory Spelling production. Um, <laughs> I, I can't decide if this is a bad seaside of tomorrow from the Annie musical or an even worse D side from a Silver Chair tomorrow writing session. I mean, they should have waited for tomorrow for a more musical inspiration because this is literal hell. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I like the, I like the like interlude beats or it sounds like it's going to kick into like, it's not unusual yeah, to be loved yeah. by anyone. It's some, it, <laughs> yes. It, they're not even trying to hide. I mean, it, it's, it's an actual cover of that, uh, of that instrumental. At, it's at, so at close those parts. that I bet Tom Jones was actually in the studio watching it. Being recorded. <laughs> Vanilla ice is just waiting to give like a very poorly defendable justification for why it's not parody and then they shouldn't have to pay copyright. He for was it. the executive producer. Oh, so thank you, Rob Van Winkle. So they were sampling essentially early sampling. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think they invented sampling is what we're really saying. Could be. I think Amish enjoyed this one. Um, Amish, Mr. Music, what do you have to say about this one? I've got problems too. <laughs> I was on the worst Presby cast episode ever. So that's what I got to say about it. Um, it's um, it's just and by worst I mean best. Just amazing, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, is there anything more we we want to say about this one? No, this is this okay. is the one it's, forgettable it's, song it's, on the album. Well, but here, okay, here's the question, and I'm, I'd like DB that that should make it the best. Yeah, because I will hear the rest of these songs when I sleep. The rest like, will haunt me. Escape. This one, not so much. Like well, I, I'm reading Pet Cemetery right now. This <laughs> record is my Victor Pascal. Like I will, he will visit me and haunt me forever. But I think. So.